Good day, Grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson on physical science. As you should know, if you're watching us on Friday, we are looking at organic chemistry and we have already started a bit of organic chemistry and we're going to carry on today. So I call it the introduction to organic chemistry because we're still doing the bits where we explain to you the different groups and everything else and we haven't got onto the very difficult bit yet. So let's get going. Okay. So it's important to know how to represent the organic molecules for two reasons. One, so that you can, well actually for a couple of reasons. One is because they're going to ask you in the exams. They're going to ask you to draw one of these, either the structural, or condensed or molecular formula, semi-structural, I will tell you about, and there's a reason I'll tell you about it, but these are the three that's examinable. But the reason they're important is because you need to be able to read them, you need to be able to draw them, and you need to be able to know the difference between them. So we need to discuss this now. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the structural formula. The structural formula shows all the bonds, it shows all the bonds. And admittedly, this isn't what the organic molecules look like. This is not what 2-methylpropane looks like and this is not what butane looks like. Obviously, because they're three-dimensional structures, they're angles to their bonds, they've got sizes that are different. Carbon is 12 times as bigger than, bigger than a hydrogen. So obviously, this is like the equivalent of a circuit diagram. It is a very plain representation of the organic molecule that helps us understand what the layout is of the carbons and hydrogens or whatever the other elements are within that molecule. So you will notice that, and this is interesting, is that this molecule here has got one, two, three, four carbons, and this has got four carbons as well, one, two, three, four. And if we count the hydrogens, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And if we count here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So both of these have got four carbons and ten hydrogens, and they are called isomers, isomers, and we'll speak about isomers later in this lesson, but the point is that we're showing you the structural formulas and then the semi-structural, etc, etc, of two isomers, which are basically, they've got the same number of carbons and hydrogens, they've just been laid out differently, just so that you can see what they look like. Now we've got semi-structural formula. Now the reason I'm including this is because this is what the textbooks use. The textbooks 99.99% .99 of the time use semi-structural formula and some of the textbooks are bad because some of them will give you a test or a question paper at the back and they'll so say write out using structural formula either some equation or whatever, and in their memo or solutions, they will have used semi-structural formula, which is incorrect, okay? You, you guys are not ever going to draw semi-structural formula in matric, okay? This is only to understand what they are writing in the textbooks. And what is happening is if you think about it, what did the butane look like? It was one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, and there were hydrogens on every one of these arms. Okay, so what does the semi-structural formula say? The semi-structural formula says that on this carbon, there are three hydrogens. On this carbon, there are three, two hydrogens. On this carbon, there are two, and on this carbon, there are three. Okay, similarly with this one, if you think about what the original structure looked like, it was like this, there was a carbon with three hydrogens, then a carbon with a hydrogen, and then another carbon with three hydrogens, and then a carbon with three hydrogens. So what the semi-structural formula has done is it has grouped these. So they said that this carbon's got three hydrogens. This carbon's got another carbon with three hydrogens, CH3. And don't forget about the hydrogen that was also on this carbon. And then this carbon's got three hydrogens. And the reason the semi-structural formula was born was because it is easier to type in a textbook, much easier to type in a textbook. And that is why it has been developed and why it is used today. 
Okay, now let's move on to the condensed structural formula. Now, this is one of the ones that you'll need to know again. So again, I'm going to write out the structural formula we got. We got this, and then we've got hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. And I know it's tedious to draw these out, but you need to draw them out, and you need to not leave out any of the hydrogens. Okay, so what are we saying on the first carbon? It's a bit fuzzy, isn't it? Let's just write CH3, CH bracket, CH3 bracket, CH3. Okay, so what are we saying? We're saying on the first carbon, there are three hydrogens, one, two, three. On the second carbon, there is a hydrogen as well as another carbon which has three hydrogens on it. That's what that bracket means. It means it belongs to that carbon. And then there is another carbon with three hydrogens. Suddenly this one we can read out. We can go, well, that's carbon with three hydrogens, carbon with two hydrogens, carbon with two hydrogens, and then carbon with three hydrogens. Okay, so it's pretty easy to understand. Okay, we could have actually shortened this even more. We could have written it as CH3 bracket CH22 CH3. Okay, so that would be quite convenient, especially if this is a way longer chain, because then what we're saying is that there's a CH3 on the end, there are two of these, one after the other, and then another CH3. Okay, so if this was, say, for example, 10,000 carbons long, then it would be so much easier to go CH3, CH2, I don't know, 9,998 CH3. Okay, so do you understand that that would make it a lot easier? Okay, next we have the molecular formula, and I haven't written the molecular formula in yet. We are going to work it out. Then the molecular formula is basically the ratio of carbons to hydrogens, but it's what actually happens. It's the actual ratio. It's not the empirical formula. The empirical formula is a basic ratio. It's a basic ratio. I'll show you what I mean. I could say to you that there are six hydrogen carbons and there are 12 hydrogens. Let's say, for example, now that would be a molecular formula saying that there is some compound which when it has six carbons has 12 hydrogens attached to it. The empirical formula of that would be CH2. It is telling me my basic ratio between the carbons and hydrogens is two to one. Wherever there's a carbon, there are two hydrogens attached to it. Okay, or for every one carbon, I will find two hydrogens, not necessarily attached to that specific carbon. So that there is the empirical formula, whereas the molecular formula tells me exactly how many carbons and hydrogens I find. So we've already spoken about this, but let's go through it again. Carbons, one, two, three, and four. So there are four carbons here. Hydrogen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. H, ten. And similarly, yeah, it's going to be C4, H, ten. And there you can see that they're obviously linked. They're obviously related to each other since they've got the same number of carbons and hydrogens. The same number of carbons and hydrogens. Um, there was something I was going to say to you about this. Okay, and remember that meant that they were isomers. They were isomers. Okay, so four carbons. Now, the empirical formula would obviously be C2H5 because that's the ratio. It's two carbons to five hydrogens. But the molecular formula tells you exactly how many carbons and hydrogens you find. Okay, now we need to talk about functional groups and grade 12, so this definition you need to learn. It is super important, super important. Okay, and this isn't all the functional groups you're going to come across, okay, but these are the first few that we are going to teach you about. So we're going to go through that in a minute, but let's just talk about this. Okay, a functional group is a bond, an atom, or a group of atoms that are responsible for the characteristic chemical reactions of those molecules. So this is very important. I've already written it twice, NB. You need to learn it, and it has to be word perfect. And the important thing is the functional group can be a bond, 
an atom or a group of atoms that are responsible for the characteristic chemical reactions. Okay, so with alkanes, and we're going to go through every one of these types of groups separately in the next few lessons, but you get alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes, and these, these, they functional group are bonds. Okay, haloalkanes, their functional group is going to be an atom an atom and your alcohols and carboxylic acids are going to be groups of atoms groups of atoms and yes i know that if you've learned organic chemistry there are still aldehydes and ketones and esters i know that i wasn't trying to summarize every single functional group in this page i just wanted you guys to get a feel for the fact that there are three different types of functional groups they can either be bonds okay or they can be a single atom or they can be groups of atoms so in this case in the alkane and we will talk about this in the next few lessons or if not, in the next few slides if not the next few lessons an alkane this functional group is a single bond between two carbons an alkene is a double bond between two carbons and alkyne is a triple bond whereas a halo alkane or alcohol halide the functional group is any one of the halogens and alcohols Okay, is an hydroxyl group and a carboxylic acid is a C double bonded OOH group, okay, which is a carboxyl group. But we will talk about each of these functional groups as we go through them. The most important is that you know this definition. So now, we need to be able to name the compounds. Now, it used to be quite a huge part of the curriculum that they used to test you on naming. And now it's again a bit sneaky because they say that the naming of the compound is not actually in the curriculum. If you read the curriculum guideline, the CAPS curriculum guideline, nowhere does it say that we have to teach you the naming. However, in the exam guidelines, they say that they expect you to be able to name or recognize a name or draw the compounds. And the only way you can do that is if we teach you how to name them. So let us teach you how to name them. So the first thing you do when you're looking for compounds or looking for the names of the compounds is you find the longest chain. Okay, you find the longest chain, which includes the functional group. It has to include the functional group, the functional group. And we will go through examples of this, okay? So the beginning of the compound tells us the number of carbons in the longest chain because we're always going to look for the longest chain that includes the functional group. Now, you guys need to learn these prefixes. You need to learn them, okay? Meth, eth, prop, but, pent, hex, hept, oct. We only have to go to eight. That's it, okay? Meth is one, eth is two, prop is three, but or bat, I don't care how you say it, is four, pent, like pentagon, is five hex like hex i always think it reminds me of six hex it's six hept is seven and eight is oct and you guys need to learn these it should be so ingrained in your skulls that if we woke up at two o'clock in the morning and said what is hex you need to be able to say six okay so meth eth prop but pent hex hept and oct the end of the compound name comes from the functional group Okay, the end of the compound name. And then there are things in the middle, middle bits that tell us a bit about more about it. And we are going to talk about that. Okay, but let's first talk about saturated and unsaturated structures. Okay, hydrocarbons that contain only single bonds between the carbon atoms are called saturated hydrocarbons. Now, grade 12s. If I ask you to define a saturated carbon, and you tell me that it is a organic, I know, if I ask you to define a saturated compound and you tell me it's an organic compound that only has single bonds, you will get it wrong. You need to say that it only has single bonds between the carbon atoms. Okay, it only has single bonds between the carbon atoms. If I say to you, and this is a sneaky one that they like to say they say define a saturated hydrocarbon and everybody goes oh i know this it's an organic molecule that only has single bonds between the carbon atoms you are half right you have defined the saturated 
you haven't defined the hydrocarbon bit yet. So you'd need to say it's an organic compound made up of only carbon and hydrogen atoms that has single bonds between the carbon atoms. Okay, you need to be careful of that. So what do we mean by when we say it's saturated? We mean that every carbon is bonded to as many hydrogen atoms as possible. Okay, in other words, there's no free arms. There's no double bonds, there's no triple bonds. There's nothing more that we can add to this. Compared to unsaturated, where a hydrocarbon that contains at least one double or triple bond is called unsaturated. So this is a double bond and that's a triple bond. And you can say that if it contains at least one double or triple bond, then it is unsaturated. So let us talk a bit about butter versus margarine. And I'm just going to start off with a little rant. Not really. This is actually important because they tend to ask it these days. And I just want to erase the writing here quickly. Okay. So the typical question I ask my students is which they think is healthier, butter or margarine? And we usually have a bit of a split class, okay? Some people say, oh, butter is better for you because it's from the earth and margarine. People say margarine, oh, but everybody says that margarine is good for you because of this phrase here, highly unsaturated fats. Okay, so let me just prefix this by telling you that unsaturated hydrocarbons require less energy to break them up, okay, than saturated. So they require less energy. So a lot of times people say, oh, it's polyunsaturated fats, means poly means many, and unsaturated means that they've got double and triple bonds, which means it's easier to break up, okay. So that's their argument. The argument from the people who sell the margarine in that is that these margarines are plant fats and that they are polyunsaturated. However, and here I'm standing on my little soapbox. This is what happens to margarine in order to make it so that we can actually eat it. Okay. And this is the path it goes through. What you need to understand is that margarine comes from plant fats. This is true, but it's an oil. It's an oil at room temperature. At room temperature, it is an oil. So the problem is that to make it nice and spreadable, like we use butter, they need to do a whole bunch of things to it. First of all, they refine it, then they bleach it because it comes to a horrible, disgusting gray color. Then they hydrogenate it, which means what? That means, and we'll talk some more about hydrogenation later, it means that they add hydrogen to it, okay? And you know all these polyunsaturated fats that they claim they have? They go. Because by adding hydrogen, they lose the double and triple bonds. They lose their double and triple bonds. Okay, triple bonds. So that means that they're no longer polyunsaturated. Then they bleach them, then they stick them together, etc. It's make them smell nice. They plasticize them, which means they make them into longer chains longer chains, which means that they're more likely to become gloopy so that we can spread it. And then they shorten it and there you get your margarine. Okay, shortening is a different thing. It's used for baking. And then they package it and everything else. So this is what happens to your margarine in order for it, or it can go this way, depending on what happens, okay? happens to your margarine in order for it to actually become um, margarine that we can take in. Whereas butter, they take creamy, they take milk with cream on it and they pound it and they pound it and they pound and they pound and they pound until it gets thicker and thicker and thicker until it gets to the point where it becomes so thick that it solidifies and then we use it as butter. Now, I'm not saying that butter is brilliant for you either. I'm just saying that compared to the two, please make an educated decision. Polyunsaturated fats are a hoax, okay? Yes, it's true that oil have polyunsaturated fats, but margarine itself, it does no longer has polyunsaturated fats because of the hydrogenation. And the reason I'm going on this little rant is because they like to ask this in the exams as well. They'll say, what process makes liquid oils 
into margarine and then they talk about this hydrogenation so i'm not making stuff up okay <laughs> this stuff actually happens and it's part of your curriculum so you need to know it and when we talk about margarine a little bit later in double and triple bonds we'll talk about it again but hydrogenation is what makes your liquid oils into canola oils for example or sunflower oil into something white like this that we can actually put on our food okay never mind the fact that it needs to be bleached to make it white okay so now let's talk about the hydrocarbons the hydrocarbons are the most basic of all your organic molecules okay so an organic molecule which contains only carbon and hydrogen atoms and no other functional groups besides single double or triple carbon carbon bonds are called hydrocarbons okay so hydrocarbons are the most simple of all your organic compounds and they are made up only of single bonds double bonds or triple bonds and only hydrogen and carbon now hydrocarbons are broken into two groups is the aromatic and the aliphatic now the aromatic is basically your smelly stuff okay like aroma aromatic is smelly okay it's where we get our smells from and all your deodorants or your flavorants things like that tend to have your aromatic um hydrocarbons and the typical and most basic of these is the benzene ring now what you need to understand is that although it is a cyclic carbon structure that looks like it has alternating single and double bonds it is not so therefore this is not examinable again okay, aromatic aromatic hydrocarbons are not examinable we will talk about aliphatic and we will talk about cyclic hydrocarbons but not the benzene rings and let me tell you about why this is special okay so there are things that are special about this which is that the double bonds here what actually happens is we have what is called resonance resonance okay and what can happen is that this the way to explain it is this is that effectively another way to draw this is to draw it like this and i'll show you now okay so there's that and then they draw a circle inside okay what happens is they've measured <clears throat> the length of this bond okay and the length of these bonds and mentioned the length of all the bonds and what they've discovered is they're all equal they're all equal what they've also discovered is that the length is longer than a single bond but it is shorter no sorry yeah um it is sorry it is shorter than a, length is sorry length is shorter than a single bond shorter than a single bond but longer than a double bond longer than a double bond it fits in between the two of them sorry blonde award okay it fits between them okay so the point is that they're, they're saying well this doesn't really work for us because what we how can we have a bond length where the bond is shorter than a single bond but longer than a double bond okay because the double bonds are actually supposed to be shorter than a single bond okay so the problem is that it doesn't fit in between the two of them so then what they said was that they've realized that actually what you have and it's kind of complicated to think about is the fact that these and the way the only way that we can understand it is that these bonds here flip okay so there's continuous flipping between these things so in other words you could have in one instant if this is okay let's call this one two three four five six and then if i do it again okay but this time it would be like this okay this is one 
two, three, four, five, and six. So what is happening is that these double bonds are flipping between their positions, but they're doing it spontaneously and they're doing it so fast that we actually can't see it. So we end up with drawing it like this where there is effectively, we know that there are six carbons that are joined and then there's this other bond in the inside that resonate between the, the, the carbons. So they resonate, they flip, they go either there or there or there or there, okay, but they flip all the time. Okay, so they call them resonance hybrids or hybrid resonance, okay, whichever you want to think of it that way. But basically what happens is we have this very special carbon structure that can flip and because it flips like this, it has very interesting bonding happening and very interesting energy levels, etc, etc. So that is why it's not examinable because it's actually quite a complicated molecule. So don't get think that this, because it's cyclic um, and because it happens as benzene, that it's going to be examinable. It is not. Okay. However, the aliphatic organic compounds, which they call the single, um, which they call straight line structures, straight line structures. Okay. That is examinable and it's funny enough we do get cyclic hydrocarbons and cyclic carbon structures inside the straight line structures but what they mean by that is that they don't have this resonant hybrid okay so let's talk about the aliphatic hydrocarbons so like i said there's ring structures which are cyclic and then there's acyclic compounds which are chain structures and we're just talking about hydrocarbons now and the hydrocarbon chain structures can be broken up into alkanes alkenes and alkynes alkanes alkenes alkynes and the functional groups for them, these are the functional groups. The functional groups are alkanes is a single bond between carbons, alkenes is a double bond between carbons, and alkynes are triple bonds between carbons. So let's talk about each of these now. Let's talk about alkanes. These are hydrocarbons that only contain single covalent bonds between their carbon atoms. Single covalent bonds between their carbon atoms and they are saturated. They're obviously saturated because there can be no other hydrogens on it. Okay, so let's talk about naming. Remember we said that the prefix, the prefix gave us the number of carbons in the main chain and the suffix, the suffix gave the um, the organic group in this case, or the functional group. In this case, it's ane. So this here has got one carbon and the prefix for one carbon is meth. So this is called methane or methane, depending on who your teacher is. Yeah, that's got two carbons in its chain. So it's going to be eth and then ethane or ethane. Yeah, it's got three. So it is going to be propane. Okay, do you get it? Okay, so these are really easy to name. It's meth, eth, prop, but, etc, etc. Okay, but what the reason I've included these two diagrams is because I want to remind you that these here are the structural formula, the basic structural formula, and it doesn't give you the idea of the three dimensionality of this molecule. If you look here, the black represents the carbon, okay? And can you see that the hydrogens, these are these little sticks here are the bonds, the so-called bonds, okay? And it comes out at an angle, so it forms like a little tripod type thing going on there, okay? And they're at an angle, they're all at angles, and they're at an angle to the carbon hydrogen, okay, carbon carbon bond. So you need to remember that this is a three dimensional object. Okay, similarly with propane, it's drawn here. So firstly, each carbon here, do you see, has got three hydrogens and they're at an angle, okay? Well, this one has, and this one has, we'll talk about this carbon in a minute. But also, you will notice that this is at an angle. The carbons, and there's the two carbons in a row, which obviously form a straight line. These carbons don't join in a straight line. They join 
at an angle and the reason for the angle is because part of the reason is because of the way these are joined onto the carbon again how the shared electrons actually are how the electrons that are being shared are held to that carbon etc etc okay so now before we carry on we need to know some definitions so an homologous series, and you need to know this definition, NB, it's very important. An homologous series is a series of compounds with the same general formula. All the molecules in the series will contain the same functional groups. So you guys need to learn this definition. There are a couple of other definitions. Again, I'm going to say to you that if you go find the exam guidelines, I would seriously and strongly urge you to go and highlight all the definitions in the exam guidelines and then study them because those are the definitions they really want you to know because there are I must admit a couple of definitions for each of the different things okay now what is a general formula the general formula is similar to both the molecular formula and the condensed structural formula okay so basically what it does is it tells us how what is the general formula for um, a specific group okay homologous series so let's us just go back up do you see here we've got one carbon and how many hydrogens? One, two, three, four. So it's four hydrogens. Let's try again. One carbon, four hydrogens. If we look here, we've got two carbons and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens. And if we look over here, we've got three carbons and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hydrogens. H okay so if you look at it carefully you can see that the general formula is CnH2n plus 2 let's check it if C was 3 H was 2 times 3 plus 2 so it's C3H 2 times 3 is 6 plus 2 is 8 and yep that's C3H8 now you might think well why is the general formula important well I could say to you, I have a molecule that is made up of C25H50. And I could say to you, is this an alkane? So you could draw it out. Okay, you could. You could draw it out and see if it's got any single bonds, any double bonds or triple bonds. However, if you know its formula, you'd know that if it was C25, if this was an alkane, it would be H. 2 times 25 plus 2 so it would have to be C25H52 so you can say no that's obviously not an alkane okay so that is one of the reasons we use general formula is that we can actually tell about larger molecules without actually having to draw them out and count them so now the alkane's most important source of fuel their most important use is that they're important source of fuel okay and they're used extensively in the chemical industry and we'll talk about that later because there is a thing called cracking in fact let's talk about it now we can take alkanes and we can crack them we can heat them up and we can break them under pressure to form alkenes and alkynes and alkenes and alkynes are very useful because alkenes and alkynes have got your double and triple bonds and they therefore can be used to react and to have other things. So we're going to talk about the reactions. We're going to talk about other reactions as well of your alkanes. But at the moment, I just want you to know that when they say they use extensively in the chemical industry, it's mainly so that they can be broken down to form alkenes and alkynes. Okay, so we've got this formula here and you need to understand something. If you've got an alkane and you react it in plenty of oxygen, you will get carbon dioxide out and water, okay? And you guys need to be able to balance these equations. You need to be able to write and balance it. And I'd like to say to you, write down the balanced equation for the oxidation of whatever, an alkane, alkene, or alkyne. Or they'll say, this is burnt in air. Write down a balanced formula for the reaction. Okay, balanced equation for the reaction. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that you guys can do that. And because there is a bit of a trick 
to part of it. So let's look at an example. Let's choose C3H8 plus oxygen gives you carbon dioxide plus water. Always gives you carbon dioxide and water. Now let's balance this. Okay. So you always leave the thing that's by itself to last, okay, because that's always the easiest to balance then. So do you agree we've got three carbons here? So if we've got three carbons here, we have to multiply this by three. Okay, then we've got eight hydrogens here, so we need to multiply this by four. So now we need to check our oxygens. Do you agree that three times two is six, and four times one is four, and six plus four is ten? But we've got two oxygens here, so what do we need to do? We need to multiply this by 5, because 5 times 2 is 10, and there we go, we're balanced. Okay, so you think, well, that's pretty easy. Let's try another one just to make sure we understand this. Okay, so let's go for C6H14 plus O2 goes to CO2 plus H2O. Okay. So let's balance, shall we? And let's choose another color. We've got six carbons here, so I need to multiply this by six. We've got 14 hydrogens, hydrogens here, so I need to multiply this by seven. So now let's have a look. We've got six times two is 12, and seven times one is seven, and 12 plus seven is 19. And now we have a problem because this, the only way this is going to be equal is if this is what? How do we get this to be the same? We'd have to multiply this by 19 over 2. Do you agree? We'd have to multiply it by 9.5 in order to make this work. But you can't have half a mole. That's like saying have half an egg or half a plate. You, well, you could have half a plate. It's like saying half, have a half an egg. Okay, you can't break open the egg and have half. You could cook it and then have half, but it's not the same. So you can't. A mole cannot be split. But there is a trick. And the trick is this. We can multiply the whole of this by 2 to get rid of that. So it becomes 2. That becomes 19. That becomes 12 and that becomes 14 and then it's balanced. So that's why I wanted to show you this because of this trick. Okay, now there's one other thing that you need to know. So please make sure you can do these and practice them, okay? There's one other thing that's very important that you need to know. And that is that this is happens when it burns in sufficient oxygen. When there's enough oxygen, it forms carbon dioxide. However, if you have CnH2n plus 2 plus oxygen, and that can be A and that can be B, and it burns in insufficient oxygen, okay, in an insufficient amount of oxygen. It is not going to form carbon dioxide, it is going to form carbon monoxide and water. Okay, so if there's not enough oxygen, it's going to form carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide is way more toxic to us humans than carbon dioxide because carbon monoxide joins onto our red blood capacitors instead of the oxygen and then basically we suffocate. So we need to practice balancing this reaction as well, just to make sure that you can actually do it. So let's say, for example, we've got C3, uh, we've done three, and we've done four. Let's do two. Okay, so, no, let's do C3. C3H8 plus O2 goes to carbon monoxide plus H2O. Okay, so we've got three carbons here, so we're going to multiply this by three. We've got eight hydrogens there, so we're going to multiply this by four. This now becomes three, and that is a four, so that becomes seven. Okay, so do you agree that that means that in order for us to get this to work, we need to multiply this by three and a half, or by seven over two. Okay, by seven over two. So again, we're going to use the same trick, exactly the same trick. We're going to say, no, no, no. We're going to multiply the whole of this by two. So it becomes two, this becomes seven, this becomes six, 
and that becomes eight. There you go. So please be aware of the fact that carbon monoxide is formed when you're burning, burning an alkane in insufficient oxygen. Okay, when there's not enough oxygen. Right, alkenes. Alkenes must have at least one double bond, at least one double bond, and they are unsaturated, okay, because of the fact that they have a double bond, and therefore they are more reactive than alkanes. Let me explain something to you. The alkanes, this, where the way the alkenes work is, this second arm, whichever is the second arm, of the carbon is weaker okay so it takes less energy to break this one so therefore we can easily break that and it be can become a carbon and it becomes an alkane again okay so it's quite easy to break that and by doing that you add hydrogens on it and that's called hydrogenation by the way um so therefore we can say that it's more reactive than alkanes. We don't have to just add hydrogen. I'm just using that as an example. Note how when you have got it in a three-dimensional space, these, they're trying to show you that they're S orbitals. So the bonds, remember, this is a three-dimensional thing. So even though they look like they look like equal signs or they're parallel with each other, they're actually shaped in space with kind of this little shape here yeah, they actually kind of do that type of thing like a kidney bean okay so now let's talk about general formula so if we again go through it and i just want to we've got two carbons here and we've got one two three four hydrogens there we have got one two three carbons here and one two three four five six hydrogens and we've got one, two, three, four, five carbons, yeah? And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hydrogens. So do you see the formula here is CNH2N. Okay, grade 12, I'm going to stop here and we will carry on with organic chemistry tomorrow. Have a wonderful day.